Hello, and welcome to Wines and Vines with myself, Christopher Mark. This episode is sponsored by Vitality, a precision viticulture company to help you enhance your soil, your vineyard, and how that connects to your winemaking. When not terroir mapping or in a soil pit, you'll also find Vitality now selling trellising, things like spreaders, stakes, as well as affordable European posts, and a few other things. You can find them at Vitality.com, where you also can find a free newsletter, which is theoretically weekly, has become somewhat monthly, with resources, news, information, tools, and tips and tricks, and all kinds of other things to be of service to the wine industry. This episode is something of an emergency uh, podcast during the uh, interregnum between our first and long promised second season, which I would really like to get out in 2024. And we just seem to be uh, far too busy all the time. But uh, for those who are maybe listening who are unaware or are in the future, this is uh, January 2024, and we've been hit by a very severe cold snap. Uh, at my own home, we hit minus 30, but more importantly, in many vineyards, uh, or really all vineyards, I've seen numbers of 24, negative 24 and a half, 25, 26, 27, uh, even colder in Vernon. And so I just wanted to, along with many others, get out some timely information on climate modeling, uh, what we can expect weather-wise, bud hardiness and vine hardiness, and just have a short to the point discussion. So you'll find that with uh, Ben Min of the Summerland Research Center and Andy Nadler of Peak Hydromet, I'm just really wanting to pull out some key information provide a bit of data. I just, again, hope this is helpful as we're grappling uh, with what's happened. So take a listen and please, if you enjoy, share and whatever else you need to do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, My name is uh, Christopher Mark with Vitality, and we're going to be talking about obviously some of the cold uh, uh, damage and extreme colds we've seen here in the Okanagan of British Columbia and how that impacts us. And then farmers and vineyards, I think even further afield. Uh, With me today, going in alphabetical order, I have Andy Nadler, who is a agricultural meteorologist, uh, PAG, uh, who's also the owner and operator of Peak Hydromet Solutions, a full service environmental monitoring company, all kinds of soil and weather stations and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, We've done lots of great work together. As well, I have Ben Min Chang, uh, research scientist at the Summerland R&D Center, uh, who's also comes from previously Washington State with obviously the very well-known Marcus Keller and many other high-end scientists. He's been doing great work, including on the environmental side, bud hardiness, things like that. Um, And I just want to say kind of from all of us in the industry to both of you, uh, really appreciate the work you've been sharing. Um, I think seeing all that and uh, it's been very helpful to people if some of the data is not uh, super optimistic. So Ben, I thought we would uh, start with you and maybe just kind of talk about, uh, as you've been sharing, what you've been seeing at Summerland in terms of uh, bud numbers and kind of where we're at and and maybe then also a bit of an background explanation for what, how to understand that data. Yeah, so what I have seen is the, well, I deal with a cold hardiness, right? So actually, they behave uh, very well this year. They pretty much reached to the potential cold hardness level, even though people worry about that kind of, we have a kind of warm December, right? But we were tracking them super closely. They actually acclimate, reacclimate to the maximum level just within a week. So that part, I think the plants did their best. And the rest was the the, the weather, and uh, basically after last uh, Friday and the Saturday cold snap, and we already dissect some bunch of buds and uh, seeing nothing living there. Yeah, that's pretty devastating. And uh, also the temperature level actually dropped to the level that might actually damage the 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 xylem, which means that might kill the truck. And uh, they, this is the, the actually the the topic I really worry about right now. Yeah. And that's just because then it's, it's purely a matter of you, you to get that cold, obviously then we're, you know, we're not just giving up potentially crop this year, the plant, you're full replanting for those plants. Yeah. Basically just like last year we had a cold, cold snap, but uh, that pretty much 
just uh, destroy the crop only. But this year we have to worry about there might we might need to replant the the whole plant. Yeah, that's the implication. Yeah. And I'm sure curious, with, with actual um, plant damage, when does that exhibit itself? Like how long till till growers know what the actual damage is? Would this be like into the growing season or uh, or will they start to know sooner? There is actually a technique to do the trunk dissection, but uh, that will open kind of like a big wound. You might introduce a pathogen into your trunk. So that's uh, sometimes a grower is kind of hesitant to do that, but uh, that's probably the... the the quickest way you can know what's roughly the percentage of chunk damage. So they, so they don't want to cut down their vine to see if it's alive? You actually don't have to chop down the whole vine. This is like a crack a tiny window. But uh, yeah, I know that's risky. But uh, yeah, there's actually uh, Washington State University in their extension article talks about uh, cold damage assessment. They actually offer some kind of a method and you can read can minimize the, the required sample. Basically what they say is uh, you start with the, the cold pocket where you might expecting the, the loss of a damage. You start there, if you see some damage, yeah, they are there. <laughs> Basically that's the message. So, right. And uh, besides that, then we probably have to wait until the growing season. But uh, during the growing season, we will probably still see bots pushing at a certain level, right? But uh, we wouldn't really see the so-called uh, the vine collapsing until later in the summer when the water demands is super high. And they will show us, okay, my damage is basically half destroyed, so I couldn't keep it up, right? So, so a vine, a vine might actually go into spring looking okay, and then it's, it's mid-season where later. they actually see that, yeah. it's, uh, that there's more damage done than, than one may have thought. Right, right. Mm. So that's very tricky. And given the level of bud damage, so obviously the, you know, we're expecting to see much smaller crops. Is that, I mean, is that even going to be that visible, right? So if the plants are already unhealthy this season, just because of bud damage, how visible would that vine collapse, say in August, you know, July, August, something like that even be? I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> really, de really depends, right? Depends on the coming summer, if that's a hot summer, unfortunately, and uh and if that's also have a drought companion with that, yeah, yeah that'd be scary. Mm. And then in terms of your bud dissections, you've obviously seen really, maybe you want to share just a little bit on the data, you, what you guys have been doing and what you've been seeing uh, in terms of your, the bud dissections you've done at this stage. Yeah, so on the, our experimental station, we have a Malort and uh, Initially, I just expecting 50% of the damage because when the cold snap came in, the maximum uh, LT50 was at a minus 22, and we pretty much get a minus 22 temperature. So that's my expectation. However, I forgot to like, deal with the, the long-term exposure thing. So we had a super like a 57 hours of uh, long-term exposure under minus 18 degrees Celsius. So that actually further killed a bunch of bugs. Yeah. So eventually it basically seen no leaving primary, no secondary, no tertiary bugs alive. Mm -hmm. And what are the, and then kind of obviously it's very varietal specific and I want to get into some of that, but kind of in terms of both those metrics so both in terms of hitting extreme cold and thinking just for people who are listening watching and for and, and again uh, ben and, and other sources washington for example has some great resources on varietal specific data um but kind of on average what would you say is the extreme cold threshold at which point we expect to see a high lte 50 which obviously is where we expect 50 percent of primary buds to die and then in terms of that threshold for length of time at a, at a shorter cold, uh, sorry, a, a, a um, slightly warmer cold, uh, what is that threshold? Again, very roughly knowing there's obviously a lot of varietal difference. Right, so so the generally speaking, I will say 50 minutes for those uh, published LT50, that's sufficient to kill the bus. 
but uh, with those uh, long-term exposure, one, for example, we actually holding at a minus 18 B Malor because uh, their primary bot could survive for six hours in that condition. Let me take a look at the data. And for that uh, secondary wall, they can bear for 10 hours, but uh, apparently what we, we went through was way longer than those numbers. Like almost two or three days below minus 18. Correct? Yes, yeah. yes. And then maybe Andy, turning to you. So what did, what have we actually seen? So obviously we have all these weather stations that you've been sharing data from, obviously you really appreciate the government ministry has put up, which has been very helpful. So maybe if you want to share uh, kind of both what we've seen in terms of actual temperatures and, and ranges. Yeah, for sure. Well, let me uh, let me show you some of the some of the reports that have been going out. A lot of people who subscribe to them have been getting this in their email. Um, and just for some background, um, these stations, there's 25 of them throughout the Okanagan. Um, these were installed this past summer, um, mostly for for tree fruit for decision support um, on the tree fruit. But of course, uh, a good weather station can be used for a lot of things. So it's um, you know I think this is great that that we can use it use them for different different purposes. So um, this data is uh, provincial data, so it's uh, um, a great resource. Um, so if you can see the the report here, this is, I think this was one of the coldest um, overnight periods. So this would be uh, um, basically the 24 hour period before January 14th. You can see some of the lows um, from north to south. Um, some of the north ones, they got pretty close to 30, minus 30, which is very cold, especially for that that region. And then as you go south, um, well, definitely some cold pockets, uh, Karameos, the Smilk Mean area, um, pretty close to minus 30 as well, Costin. But then down into the, uh, the Soyuz area, you know, kind of that minus 23, minus 24. So um, kind of a typical uh, north-south um, spread. But uh, definitely, nobody was spared of of the cold weather during during this period. Um, now, I do want to show another uh, visual here. I think this is this maybe speaks to what Ben was talking about in terms of the the durations of cold weather. So this is the same information. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit if I can. Um, same information, but presented a little bit differently. So if we look, um, actually, just on the on the um, kind of on the the overview uh, what it's showing is the red areas are area are the time frame so this goes from january 11th to january 15th the end of the 15th so it's over that four-day period that kind of was that sort of that kind of that really cold time um, so the red are the areas that are below minus 21 so those are the areas where the, the temperature stayed below the orange areas are below minus 18 the um yellow areas are below minus 15 and then the gray are above minus 15. So this, you can really see the duration. So if we take, um, you know, let's just go down to say one of the, uh, say South Okan Okanagan here in a you can see um, the, um, actually all over South here, you can see that the temperature drip bl dip below minus 15 around uh, the 11th, just a uh, few hours into the day but then that minus 18 that you were talking about ben um so there's the 11th at about 7 30 it dropped down you can see it stayed down and basically stayed down until roughly um about the 14th at six in the morning so quite a long duration but then we also have during that time it actually dropped below that minus 21 as well so in this case it's showing 12 hours below minus 21 um so there's oliver there uh, so yes, north, very similar. You can see all of them are very, very similar in terms of that duration of the, the really cold temperatures. So all of them around that 12, 12 and a half hours um, dip below that minus, uh, minus 20, 21. Um, you know, same with Bocaramios, a little bit longer. Uh, Summerland area, as you can see, a little bit longer still. Plus there was that previously, that that other dip. So you actually had a Two, two sort of prolonged periods of, of that minus 21. And then as you get further north, it just uh, it really it didn't even warm up. You look at, say, Winfield. Um, so some of these areas around Vernon, uh, we're seeing, um, you know, a day and a half. So one day, 13 hours, um, one day, 15 hours. So quite a long time, just extended extended freezing. So um, definitely, uh, definitely a very, uh, very severe cold snap. Yeah, 
That looks cool. Um, and just for those who are listening, we've uh, um, Andy's just sharing some effectively uh, uh, bar charts showing how very cold it got. Um, and yeah, so then what, so we've really pushed. And so from Ben Min, one question I had specifically kind of on that temperature threshold. So again, noting that there's obviously significant varietal differences in cold hardiness. On average, would you say minus 21 is roughly a threat kind of consider we could, could we consider that kind of an average thre threshold um, that we're going to see significant bud death, you know, primary bud death below that temperature? I think uh, minus 21 might cost about 10%. Mm. If they only experience 50 minutes, that will be 10% damage. Mm. Right. But uh, overall, I think uh, the, the LT50 or uh, the average LT50 now is at, was at uh, minus 23. So mm. they actually did really well. Mm. And so then, but then if we're at minus 21, obviously over an hour, you know, if we're hitting that over an hour or two. Yeah, that still doesn't matter. Yeah. Top. Um, one follow-up question I had, Ben, was just around kind of thinking in the future, the time to hit. So when you're saying that they really hit that cold hardiness, now was that in approaching the cold? Like when did you actually really see uh, the vines here hit that max cold hardiness? Uh, the, 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 I think we did, uh, the closest one was, uh, maybe a couple of days before the cold snap. Hmm. Yeah. That one shows really good data. Okay. And so that start that really, and that started as we started to enter the cold, like, was that an extended period of hardening off? Was that, you know, over many months consistent or did, as we started to hit that longer cold, we really, then the vines really hardened off and, and aggressively, um acclimated it's a gradual change but uh during the last phase they still have ability to kind of jump up maybe a couple degree and they're going back again yeah so they kind of fine tunes over that short period that's something they can do yeah but overall it takes uh, months decreasing from maybe from minus 10 to minus 20. yeah so then do you think one of the questions i've had is obviously Last year when we had the cold, which was not as severe, but obviously we had a late harvest in a lot of areas. This year, obviously, our harvest was extremely early. Um, so do just, you know, obviously in your data, were you seeing that? Is that reflected in the data from your perspective? That's part of why we saw or is that potentially relevant, potentially not? Yeah, I think we like last year, the maximum cold hardness level was about maybe up to uh, minus 22, or most of them probably stay at uh, minus 21. So that's a difference we're seeing. This year we're seeing better number, like minus 23. Yeah. Hmm. So and so, and uh, yeah, a couple of degrees difference. Yeah, which could be significant, obviously, yeah. maybe a little less so this year. But do you, do you think any of that had to do with the fact that the plants had a longer acclimation period? Because Definitely. we did. Yeah, yeah. that's a one important factor there. So as we're thinking, and again, as we're trying to think of positive outcomes coming out of this, one of the lessons is there really is a real advantage to, in terms of hardiness, to earlier harvests than from just from a acclimation, cold hardy, you know, plant hardiness perspective. Yeah, and uh, and uh, just uh, they to to have a really good cold hardiness, they probably have to accumulate some starch in the in the in the woods. So yeah, that's something I'm thinking about. Oh, maybe just because last year they are still pushing energy or sugar into the berries, they couldn't really accumulate anything in the in the in the woods. So that's a part of reason probably why they couldn't do that work. Yeah. Hmm. So one hypothesis. Yeah. One one question as well I had Andy was just on how big a difference, and Ben, please jump in if you've seen this as well, but I know, Andy, you've done a lot of kind of, you know, not just on vineyards, but other farm sites. I'm curious on temperature variation. Do you ever see significant temperature variations within a site? So one of the questions I'm wondering about is if we're planting or if we're even planning what areas to protect, you know, given vineyards are often on a slope, um, is there going to be a significant difference poten uh, potentially between different areas of the vineyard if we have you know, we have a decent sized slope or anything like that, or in your work from your perspective, is that difference fairly minimal? Well, 
the general answer is yes, it's very extremely variable. Like when you look at during the growing season, where if you measure, um, say, long term temperature, those types of things, frost occurrence, everything, you're going to see huge differences between, you know, different parts of the vineyard. And I think every, you know, every manager knows the parts of their vineyard that are warmer and colder, wetter, you know, and they have to be treated differently. Um, that that being said, during the last week, I, I don't I don't suspect the difference difference was huge in terms of effects. Um, and, and Ben can correct me if I'm wrong, but if it's a two degree difference between here to here, you know, one corner to the other corner of the vineyard, um, when it's minus 25 or minus 23 for 12 hours, is that going to make a big difference? Um, you know, you mentioned the 15 minute thing. That's probably if we would have had a very, you know, a very slight dip type event, you know, like say a spring or fall frost where it's, you know, it's a little more episodic, maybe an hour, two hours, you'd see that difference, but it's sort of like, um, you know, I guess the, you know, the threshold was way back there. So I, it doesn't seem like it would have made a huge difference in this case where, um, you know, is there going to be differential damage across the vineyard? Yep. Probably just for other reasons too, but um, whether it be because of t temperature and conditions, uh, I don't know. I'd, I'd suspect not. Probably not. Just like a overwhelmingly cold air is there and that's like overpass the threshold. Like it doesn't matter what kind of a terrain, maybe you have a two degree di Celsius difference, but doesn't matter. It's already way lower than the threshold. Yeah. But, but I am curious, and uh, maybe one of you guys can answer this is, Say say we're in a period where a week before the event, we know that it's coming, you know, crystal ball forecast is accurate saying we're going to drop to minus 25 or minus 23 for, for a day. What what could I do if I know that's coming? Like, I know there's been growers talking about stuff like geotextiles. Um, I'm even aware of by uh, um, uh, Winfield area, one of the growers is an orchard has had a, a helicopter out to try and circulate the air in case there's an inversion. I don't know if it really worked, but... Are, are there other things you could do to save your, uh, you know, to, to, to minimize the damage? Like if you're, if you know it's coming and, you know, whether you have a day or a week or a month notice and, and what kind of things are growers thinking about right now in terms of next time this happens? Yeah. So I'm thinking I, my, my, so in my lab, I probably will try just like you said, the geotextile fabric things. And I see if I can actually use the heat on the ground to heating up the tiny space inside the fabric. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something we can try, but uh, yeah. And uh, the other thing in the early earlier season, probably they can maybe use uh, the heal te technique, healing technique, and just try to protect the uh, grafting union. That's the other example. Yeah, but uh, you have to do it before the ground frozen, right? So you probably couldn't say, "Oh, now we know the the cold snap is coming in in two weeks or one weeks," but the ground probably already been frozen for a while, right? Yeah, so there is a kind of minimum things or practice we can do in this case. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are two, to my mind, uh, like Ben's hitting at, there's kind of two different approaches there, in terms of the immediate sense of what you can do, like what could anyone have done two weeks ago? Nothing. Um, I, you know, the, you're just, if, if you don't have the equipment in place now, if you did have geotextiles, you know, previously installed, um, you know, that's obviously an option like Ben's talking about, we've been looking at some thick netting. So one of the funny things to me is we, we've worked with a French trellising company. And so they have in France, this thick netting they use, um, which still allows spray to get through, but it's like really thick. And then they also have this heated cabling. And I said to them, there's no way we're going to need that here. It's too expensive. And all of a sudden now it's like, well, maybe. So in, I know in Quebec, they use it in France. Now often it's used for spring frost. But pairing some sort of heating element, you're talking about maybe something from the ground, Ben, I wonder if there's even a natural gas option with some sort of netting or geotextile that's going to trap the heat that'll save you five degrees. Um, that's kind of seems to be the rough range I've seen in the data is that for people, it's around five degrees. Now, of course, that could be very different at minus 10, minus 20 or minus 30. I don't know if that, how consistent that is. Like you said, there's healing, but then you really need to build the vineyard for that and kind of i think one of the ultimately the crop matters but i think from a soil perspective too you're then significantly disturbing the soil yeah right 
which again could be totally if you're saving your crop there's no question i'm not but i think that is just you know there are trade-offs with regularly burying your vines where you are really negatively impacting the soil because you're moving a lot of soil to heal it up and then also you need to plan really for think often you know your people are lowering their vines and there's there's other things you're doing right um, logistically there's uh, so many concern about that yeah exactly and one of the questions i actually had following up on andy's uh, for you ben just curious with your data is one of the you know we are obviously talking a lot about cold hardy varieties now you haven't heard some mention of you know hybrids or even the peewee hybrids coming out of europe we had a chance to drink some of them in uh, france which was interesting um but one of my concerns is the trade-off is that obviously uh, you're very often are almost always trading off you get more if you get more cold hardiness you're left less heat um you are less you're more sensitive to heat and so i'm just curious with your data or any of your work have you really seen that um you know that is where some of the varieties you've looked at you've very clearly seen that trade-off in the data or perhaps you disagree well i uh in taiwan so original from taiwan we actually grow the hybrid grapes called kyoho that's a uh, actually the most planted grapevine in the world and uh yeah they're actually doing okay there in a <laughs> tropical place and they're super humid yeah so i don't really have a concern uh from what i know uh we did have some like a cold sorry not cold uh, the heat dome events in washington when i was there and uh, i don't really see the concord grapes which is another uh, hybrid common hybrid uh, grapes there right i don't really see difference from uh beneath for us mm. they're pretty resilient to a certain degree like 40 it should be okay so you're saying you're not from your experience you don't see that difference so like so yeah concords are obviously very winter hardy and so they're still do well you've seen them still do well in heat events yeah yeah, yeah. but uh well that's just a few hybrid i have seen so <laughs> yeah um one so one question also i just wanted to make sure we touched on uh with you ben was just just quickly talking on um you know obviously this is a podcast so we're not doing a demonstration but just on bud dissection and and just very quickly prefacing it part of the reason i just wanted to make sure to touch on this is we've had a few clients who are very experienced growers very experienced viticulturalists and their the relationship between their bud dissections and what they've seen and then results have often varied wildly where some of them have come to me and said i'm never doing bud dissections again it's pointless it just it never it doesn't work you know it, it doesn't work now are they actually doing a good job i've had some people tell me you, you don't you're not actually good at it until you do a thousand that it's in one sitting um so just curious in terms of doing um if there's any just verbal tips you can give uh just quickly in terms of doing an effective bud dissection or any other thoughts you have yeah, I think the most common mistake while you're doing blood dissection, the first one is, did you leave them in the room temperature long enough to develop that color? Like, uh, don't rush, okay? <laughs> they need uh, some time in the room temperature to develop those uh, colors. So I would say maybe 20 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, that should be sufficient. So that's a first uh, common mistake. And the other is uh, the depths, uh, how deep you cut. That's the other one. If you cut the bus too deep, you're, you're actually exposing the xylem tissues down below and they are looks just always green somehow. They don't really develop too much uh, brown or dead color. Yeah, so that's uh, the second one. Yeah, so I'm thinking, oh, maybe it sounds like uh, they probably cut too deep. So they're exposing, uh, they basically already remove all those dead tissues and they're just exposing whatever lies below. Okay. No, thanks for that. Uh, Andy, and please jump in on this one too, Ben, if you have any thoughts. One question as well I wanted to touch on was um, soil temperature. Mm. So um, one thing I know, Ben, when we had the uh, pruning workshop, you obviously mentioned that uh, we had, uh, generally speaking, you weren't seeing, at least in the data, you were looking at soil temperature going below zero. So I actually looked, and in the last three days, one of our uh, sites we have a soil temperature at, at a client we hit i think negative three at the 10 centimeters and around negative two at 20 centimeters so yeah my question is kind of what when we hit these colds and i know andy you've looked at lots of soil moisture what or soil temperature apologies uh uh is there anything we can kind of expect in terms of correlation you know with we got snow on the ground in terms of um 
that temperature. And then Ben, in terms of roots, and again, if you have any comments there as well, uh, when we should start to get worried about root damage. Yeah, I definitely can't speak to the physiological side. I'll leave that to Ben. But yeah, yeah with, with soil temperature, um, uh, probably a lot of it is going to depend site by site. Um, generally, if there's snow cover, that's going to make a huge difference just because it provides that insulation layer that, uh, you know, you, the temperatures or the soil temperatures, they're just not going to be as extreme. So um, probably anywhere that did have a bit of snow cover, um, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be more moderate um, with the snow coming right now. Um, probably, uh, you know, that'll, I guess maybe it's a little bit late, but there'll be, uh, you know, looks like there'll be a lot of snow coming down. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing too, even with soil moisture, that's going to have an effect on, uh, on the soil, soil temperatures, just because it does affect that thermal, um, that, uh, thermal transmission. So, um, yeah, just, I guess a lot of factors that, that do, do, um, influence it, but, uh, certainly when you have, uh, a prolonged period with these low temperatures, that soil temperature is going to drop a fair bit and, you know, get a little bit, a little bit deeper than it normally would, I think. Mm. And I can, I can talk about the threshold that kill the roots. Usually, uh, they don't really acclimate or the acclimate doing anything there. Just a constant, maybe, uh, what's that? Uh, minus five to minus seven degree. That's uh, where you have to worry about the temperature might kill the roots. Hmm. Yeah. And is there, do we, uh, is there any sense? I'm just thinking if we're, you know, someone doesn't have a soil moisture sensor that they can look at this data and just kind of planning if we're kind of thinking we have a kind of a normal level of snowfall is there any point at which we have any sense of what the relationship between air temperature and soil temperature would be or is that just there's just too many variables and we can't really guess without looking at actual data my experience is there are just a lot of variables that it, it is really going to pend even just a, you know a little bit of mulch or something is going to make a big difference compared with bare soil a very big difference and then it like i said with snow cover things like that so um there's probably yeah, it's probably going to be very much of a crapshoot to do it that way. Um, probably the easiest way is if someone has a handheld, you know, temp thermometer or probe or something just to, you know, check a few spots just to see, to see what it looks like. And even if you're doing the surface, if it's, um, you know, the, it always in winter, it always freezes from the top. So um, if, you know, if your top few inches are, are fine, then you can assume that your lower, you know, your lower temperatures are going to be not as cold. So it's uh, something to look at. When you say handheld, do you mean if someone even just has a meat thermometer? Is that what you're... Perfect. Not? Yeah. Not your... <laughs> yep. Well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it has the setting on it. You know, it'll have your steak, your chicken, that type of thing. It probably doesn't have, uh, you know, root mortality, but you can uh, you get a Sharpie. Uh, were you going to say something, Ben? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other question I had as well, and, and certainly been hearing from people, is what we can expect. So I'll start with Andy here and Ben again. Please jump in um, in the future. So I think one of the big questions, a huge question is obviously, you know, we had last year where it got very cold and everyone seemed to think this was just a one-off. Uh, we got hit harder this year in a very warm winter. Um which potentially maybe we were more susceptible. And so I know obviously, Andy, you spend a lot of time on this. What do we have any sense, a, a two-part question, is there any sense of what we can expect in terms of having these kind of freak, very cold events? And then B, how confident can we be in those estimations, in those models and predictions? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a loaded one because, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of models, and there's a lot of disagreement on it too, just in terms of, you know, what's happening, what are some of the trends, but... Uh, one thing that is interesting is there seems to be um, a correlation between the extreme events in terms of, um, you know, cold snaps, prolonged heat domes, droughts, those types of things. They're all those, you know, those those sort of abnormal events that, you know, they seem to be getting more more common, which is a big thing. But there's also some really interesting research I was just looking at just in terms of, you um, um, some of the correlations with the uh, with the Arctic heating. So what's happening is with the the movement of systems, basically they're going they're they're weaker, they're they're going slower, they're stalling, which is causing some of these extreme events like the you know the prolonged cold that type of thing. So there, there's definitely some some evidence showing that yeah with with the warming um, Arctic latitudes that the mid latitudes 
um, it is being affected with with these type of events. So it's not necessarily uh, what we want to hear. You know, a lot of people just assume that well, we're going to have more heat domes, more, you know, more heat. But at the same time, um, yeah, you know, these cold snaps, snap, they may be uh, they may be more more common. And do you have a sense just how? Because I think this is obviously something that's very controversial, even within the scientific community. If you're saying that, do you have a sense of how confident? Like, is this obviously this is what the models are suggesting? But if you you know, if we're putting a probability on how accurate they are, um, you know, and obviously there are many, which then could lead to a million other different outcomes. But just do you have a sense? Do you have any sense of confidence in how accurate you would how confident you would be in that statement, or can you not even answer that question? Well, it's I, I probably shouldn't, but it, it seems like there is evidence, which is which is something um, just to show there are some correlations, whether that continues or whether things change. That's, you know, a little bit up in the air. But I think the fact that there is some of that correlation that's been happening, I think, is is maybe an indicator that uh, that this is what what is to come. And, you know, we were talking earlier about. You know, last year it happened, you know, was that a one in 10 year? Was that a one in 20 year? And when these one in 20, we are one in 50 year, one in 100 year events start happening every year, you start to wonder, okay, is it, uh, you know, is this becoming normal? So I think that's, that's the big concern in terms of, you know, what is, what is normal? And, you know, this, this word that everyone uses, which annoys me, you know, unprecedented, but um, at the same time, it's, uh, you know, we are starting to see things more often and, you know, rare events and that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely of concern. I don't know if, uh, and it's fine if you don't, I don't know if you have any comments or on that, Ben, with the work you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, before I kind of wrap us up, uh, just obviously wanted to be respectful of your guys' time. Is there anything... I haven't asked, I should have, is there anything you would like to bring up as we kind of think of, we have uh, vineyards and other farm growers here, obviously grappling with these colds. Is there any uh, information, data, uh, comments um, that I haven't hit? And maybe I'll uh, start with you, Andy, and then go to you, Ben. I, I guess just to uh, to throw out the information, um, very fairly hastily, a few days ago, uh, you and I, Chris, we put together this report to send out to growers and I think it was it was timely and good information and we got some of Ben's information and the stuff from Summerland um it was kind of a nice uh I guess a nice package and I think a lot of a lot of growers appreciated it we got a very quick uh subscriber distribution list uh which was nice to see so I think um given that there's been some some interest we'll uh we'll probably continue to try and put out good information. We won't, I think through the winter, we won't do daily reports just because when nothing too exciting is happening, you know, we don't want to don't want to just send too much. Maybe we'll, we'll drop it down to weekly, but uh, during the growing season, I think we can probably resume, have some information sent out. And I guess we'll be looking for, uh, you know, for input in terms of what uh, what growers would like to see, because uh, if it's of use, then uh, then we can probably do it. So I guess I'll just throw out that plug. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And we have this government data and it just we need to get it out to people. So I think, uh, you know, it's great it's there. And yeah, I appreciate your work on that. I guess the only other piece I'd add to that is, um, you know, with the existing network, I showed you the map a few minutes ago. Um, if this is, if people are listening, then maybe this doesn't apply. But um, there is a big, kind of a big gap that Okanagan Falls area um, where, and, and the reason was just, I think, because there was just less uh, tree fruit in some of those areas, but uh, um, there is a little bit of a gap there. So maybe that's something we can look at uh, filling just in terms of getting a kind of a complete picture of the, of the whole Valley, because um, you know, the more, the more representation we can get, the better. So if anyone's listening and has what a Davis weather station, get in touch or whatever. Yeah, we can, uh, we can figure it out. I do have uh, um do have one that was sent to me, so I just have to uh, work on getting it in. Perfect. Yeah, about, about that. Like, uh, do you take a uh, meter meters uh, weather station? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, if you got you some. Uh, let's talk. to join you guys. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, how about you, Ben? Is there anything we didn't touch on um, that you want to make sure we shared? Um, I I will I will say. I really appreciate how fast the people start to working together. Yeah, I'm really happy to see like uh, how we shared information over your network or even on the Facebook uh, page. That was amazing. Yeah, 
I, I, I definitely think uh, people are part of the resilience in the system. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. No, thank you. I mean, you've been you've been very busy. You were at the pruning workshop giving a talk this morning. <laughs> uh, yeah, now you're here. Um, maybe as I close this out, I'll just kind of summarize the key findings and then please just or or takeaways, action steps, kind of anything where someone's listening and then please uh, jump in, either correct me or add on anything I missed. So um, we have uh, we have hardiness numbers. And so Ben, you've been sharing from the Summerland Research Center and yours' work, uh, which we'll make sure to append to all of this, but specific varietal, varietal hardiness numbers so we can see where they're at. Uh, and then the temperatures we hit. Uh, in general, minus 23, obviously very big varietal differences, but we can kind of consider, especially right now with how hardy our plants got, minus 23 kind of was a threshold. We obviously went quite a bit beyond that. And then in terms of an extended period of at least six hours, or for primaries, maybe eight to 10 for secondaries at around negative 18 degrees was also another threshold uh, where we saw a significant bud death. Um, and we hit the point uh, which we expect to see uh, damage to the xylem. And Ben, can you remind me what temperature roughly we would expect that at? I think uh, for xylem, probably uh, the LTE 50 of the bus, just minus maybe three, four degrees, that would be a kind of like an estimation, but uh, you can find uh, better data or information over Washington State University's, their uh, co-hardiness website. Yeah, they yeah. do offer those uh, thresholds. Perfect. And I'll make sure to, to link to that as well. And just actually a quick comment, just if anyone's listening and doesn't know, uh, Ben, just want to share what LT50 is, LT10, LT90, just uh, if anyone's listening and uh, wasn't familiar. Yeah, so those LT50. are... Yeah. yeah, so those, temper those are the... The, the abbreviation for the temperature that will kill, for example, LT10 means the temperature will kill 10% of the bus population. Basically, that's the definition. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. And then, um, and so obviously LT50, 50%, and that's where we obviously exceeded potentially what LT90, if I remember from your, gra your other graph in a lot of places, including in Summerland, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And one, and just one quick note there, just technical note as well, because uh, uh, LT when they're talking, when Ben's talking about it, he's talking about primary buds. Now in the research, because of how they do the cooling, I learned this from you yesterday, Ben. It uh, because you're cooling it artificially in a freezer, uh, it does will quickly kill the the primary, secondary, and tertiary. In a live plant, it does have more possibility of using protective mechanisms to ensure the ice crystals don't immediately kill the secondary and tertiary. So there's a slightly higher chance that those will survive. So when we're talking LT, 50, et cetera, we are just talking about the primaries at that stage. Um, although obviously there is a risk to the secondary. Ben is nodding. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. That's, um, my, that's my hypothesis though. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's still the, 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 the mechanism is still being a, being a mystery. Yeah, we need a more study about those mechanisms. So we haven't figured everything out yet. That's, no. that's yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then in terms of temperature ranges, giving people a rough idea, Andy shared a map from our uh, government weather stations, where one of the things we saw is obviously we saw a pretty strong temperature gradient north to south with definitely some pockets, I would say, westward. So obviously Vernon was the coldest, but then getting into Caramios was very cold, the Soyuz being the warmest, and then getting colder as we went north, uh, and then potentially slightly wet, uh, west. So I saw Summerland got, got decently cold as well. Um, in terms of expectations, obviously we can expect, it sounds like there seems a likelihood to see more of these events with the, uh, Arctic, uh, mid latitudes, uh, warming up. Um, and then obviously there's a whole question of what do we do about this, which is a whole other discussion we touched on a bit. Is there anything, uh, either of you gentlemen did I, that I missed that you wanted to make sure I just rehashed? I think you are staring at me and shaking my head. Okay. Shaking their head. Um, well, I'll let you guys uh, say goodbye. I just, again, want to thank uh, Andy of Peak Hydromet and Ben uh, Min of uh, uh, Summerland Research Center for sharing with uh, all of us. I really appreciate your guys' time. Yep. Thank you all for right. the invitation. Thanks, guys. Take care. Ben Min can be found at the Summerland Research Center website. The easiest way to get there is certainly by Google. You can find a lot of his research and other ongoing work there, as well as he's been posting regularly on the Okanagan Valley Viticulture Facebook page. Thank him for that. 
and a lot of the past research him and many of his colleagues have done at Washington State, as he references in this podcast, can be found online at the Washington State University. We'll include those links in the show notes, but again, anything on quick Google on cold hardiness in Washington State will pull up a lot of those resources, which are well worth checking out. Andy of Peak Hydromet can be found at peakhydromet.com. That last part is H-Y-D-R-O-M-E-T.com. If you're interested in any weather stations, soil sensors, environmental monitoring, anything really an agricultural meteorologist uh, could do for you. Andy certainly does great work. We have a huge thanks to both Andy and Ben for joining us today. Mm-hmm.